invite you to join with me in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, as you call us once more, inviting us to worship and to your table, prepare our hearts that we may hear and accept your word, silence any voice but your own, and open us up to your expansive, life-giving word offered to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Paul wrote to the church in Philippi these words of encouragement, which are a counterbalance to the earlier reading talking about Peter's vision and how God called him to a broader, more inclusive understanding of God's grace. Listen to God's word from Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 15. Paul writes, If anyone has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I've come to regard as loss because of Christ. And more than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes from faith in Christ, a righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. And if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead, not that I've already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. So let those of us then who are mature be of the same mind. And if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's start with a very big question. Why are there so many religions in this world? Today is World Communion Sunday. We are celebrating communion with people gathered in churches or virtually brought together over a shared meal of bread and wine. And we're telling once more this story of Jesus Christ, telling it in our own language and in our own lands. And we Picture as we do this, a communion table big enough to stretch from California to Connecticut, from Bolivia to Beijing, from Sierra Leone to Singapore. But near to all those different communion tables and churches and cathedrals are also people of other houses of worship, people of other religions, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Sikhism, Confucianism, and many more. If God is God of all the world, then why are there so many different religions in this world? Now, actually, this is a relatively modern question. For most of church history, there were simply those who believed in Jesus Christ and those who didn't. And the idea was taught that anyone outside the church, well, they were simply to be converted or conquered. The official church dogma was very clear on this point. Extra ecclesiam nulla salus. Outside the church, there is no salvation. Those words and that dogma was decreed by St. Origen in the 3rd century, by St. Augustine in the 4th century, by Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, and on. The Catholic Church, thankfully, has since moved away from that hardline stance. 
but then it's true to say that there are still some Catholics and still many conservative Protestants who believe that the merciful God they worship is literally condemning billions of people as being outside of God's plan of salvation. It's sad and it's wrong. Over the last 500 years, we've had a chance to travel and to learn a tremendous amount about all the different world religions. And over the years, particularly in recent years, we've welcomed into our communities people that follow different faith traditions. Now, as we've gotten to know them, we know there are things to commend in those religions and things to question and criticize, just as is true for our own religion. There is much to celebrate and still much to repent in our Christian church history. But in general, we've come to see that our Muslim and Hindu and Jewish and Buddhist neighbors are ultimately no less truthful, honorable, compassionate, or generous than our Christian neighbors. That sentiment was reflected in a Super Bowl commercial that if I can call upon Tim, we'd like to insert that and show that to you now. Come on. That is a great question. I gotta go. Long story short, you're probably fine. Yeah, bye. Sorry, man. No worries, we're not late. Let's go. Where am I going? What's going on? Seatbelt. Oh, God. <laughs> Come Funny. on. Go, go, go. Go. Oh! Seriously, guys? Can I change the music? No. OK. All right. There he is. <laughs> nice shoes. Yeah, those are cool. Can you go any slower? We're fine. We're not late. We're late now. I got this. Looking good, boys. I know. Let's do this. Come on. See what happens when you're late? I'm already down. No, it actually wasn't my fault. Oh, come get it. Come on. I was not that late. late. Now, it's not very often you get a commercial break in the middle of a sermon, but I, I appreciated that commercial because what it showed was that those different men and women with their own different faith traditions were not only friends, but they were colleagues literally rooting for the same team. And I would believe that each was a person capable of kindness, that each sought what was good and just and loving for one another and frankly for the world around them. When I was in middle school, one day I knocked on the door of my pastor and I asked him how it was possible that a child born in India was somehow outside of God's love. Well, now that the roles are reversed and I'm the one seated in a pastor's office, it's only fair that I offer a brief answer to my own question. So first, I do not believe that that child in a village in India is outside of God's love. God is aware of all life on earth, all people of all lands. And so by definition, this awareness is of a loving and a graceful nature, not of indifference or of judgment. So in ways I may not understand, God is at work and in relationship with all people everywhere. But secondly, Whatever I've come to know about God is because God accommodated the fullness of God's grandeur to the limitations of my own mortal reality. Give examples. When Moses was on Mount Sinai, he knew he could not see the full glory of God, and so he hid himself in the cleft of a rock. And when God passed by then, he was able to glimpse just the hem of God's robe. 
The Hebrew people knew they could not take in the fullness of God's omnipotence and wisdom, and so they were given the Ten Commandments. They were given the Torah laws to guide them. They were given prophets that would encourage them and guide them back to ways of justice. And over time, people of this planet simply did not understand God's call. And so God once more accommodated God's self, being incarnate in Jesus Christ, emptying God's self, taking on human flesh, healing, teaching, dying in a sinful world, and then being raised so that we too might be people who glimpse the fullness of that story and live with resurrection hope. I first heard all those Bible stories when I was growing up as a child in Kansas. And I heard those stories in English. I heard them as a white male in America. Yet nothing in the gospel allows me to prioritize my experience over others. My maleness, my whiteness, my English-speaking Americanness is not the automatic norm for how this faith is to be expressed or interpreted. Far from it. Whatever amazing grace allowed me to come to faith in Christ is just as active in others, non-male, non-white, non-American, non-English speaking. It would be idolatry for me to suggest otherwise. But let me take this one step further. The scientists talk about how light can be understood as both a particle and as a wave. That the photons react to the world around them in the environment both as a measurable particle and as an oscillating wave. So with light, the same reality is present in two different forms. But when we talk theologically, we routinely talk about how God has been known to us as a trinity, as God the creator, as God in Christ the Savior, as God the life-giving spirit. One reality made known in three different forms and ways. So if God can accommodate God's self so that you and I come to know God, Can't that same reality be accommodated in different ways in different religions so that people around the world can grow in the image of God in their own land? Must the particle of faith found in the Bible somehow rule out the wave of faith that moves through the Torah, the Quran, the Upanishads, and others? Now I need to say I'm not a universalist. I do see true and distinctive value in the doctrine of God as revealed to us in Christ. But in this sermon, what I'm trying to do is take seriously what Paul has written to the church in Philippi. So think back. Paul is talking about himself biographically. And he says, I was a strict and pious Pharisee, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, a follower of all the requirements of the law. But his call to Christianity did not mean for him that he was going to hate or renounce his prior Jewish faith. God's covenant with Abraham was still very real and very valid for Paul. What Paul was stepping away from was any effort to measure his self-worth by old categories and old credentials. Circumcision, tribal identity, high marks in Bible study, and moral behaviors, those things he would no longer allow to be the guides that define his righteousness. Instead, he professed, my righteousness comes from Christ alone. And we too have a lot to learn from what Paul has written here, because our race, our gender, Our citizenship papers, our college transcripts, our bank account balances, our Presbyterian perfect attendance pens, those things do not stamp us as righteous before God. Paul knew he'd been doing the math all wrong. The things he'd had in his credit column, when he treated them that way, were actually debits. For Paul and for us, having things that 
simply boost up our own ego, reinforce our own prejudices, or conversely, having things that fill us with self-doubt and anxiety because we're so afraid we're going to flunk the salvation final exam. Those things, if we thought they were positives, are actually negatives. Paul counted them all as loss, as hindrances, in comparison to the surpassing good news of God's love, revealed, accommodated to us, and persistently shown in Jesus Christ. Now Paul isn't quite sure how to put this idea into words, but in verses 8 and 9 of what I read to you, he came up with a great phrase. He said, My ultimate goal is to gain Christ and to be found in him. Now, if Paul had only said the first words, to gain Christ, it would sound like a works righteousness, that we're going to earn our way into heaven. But he added to that the other phrase, to be found in him. We are clearly dealing with something that's far bigger than ourselves. Our goal, our spiritual motivation is then to step into that reality, to be welcomed by grace and love into this reality that is large enough to embrace the entire world, yet personal enough to know us by name, to gain Christ and to be found within him. No more checklists of personal privilege, no more narrow definitions of faith, that are defined only by what we see in the mirror before us, but trusting instead that we belong to God, that we are found in Christ, the Lord of all, the light of the nations, our hope and our peace. As I said at the beginning of this sermon, to ask why there are so many religions is a very big question. And people of faith do not always agree on how to answer it. And that's why I included verse 15 at the end of today's reading. It's a tagline where Paul says, Let's strive to be of one mind. But if you think differently about anything, well, this too God will reveal to you. Our God is not done with any of us yet. The narrow doctrine of Catholic dogma that said outside the church there is no salvation was stepped away from dramatically in the writings of Vatican II and by scores of theologians since. The potential for vibrant interfaith cooperation has been proven over and over again. We've seen it in the recent decades as we've learned from each other, gracefully respected one another, walked side by side for justice with one another, and even cheered for the same hometown teams together. The African-American theologian Willie James Jennings has written, We live in a reality where the world is always too much for us to hold all at once. In this day and age, in this world of interfaith dialogue, in this time of global calls to action, we need to be the best Christians possible. We need to be willing to talk honestly with our Jewish, Hindu, and Muslim friends about why being found in Christ means all the world to us, even as they talk to us about how the reality of God has been revealed to them in the rituals and the doctrines and the teachings of their traditions. By talking about your faith to a person of another faith or of no faith, is the best way to grow more fully into the image of God, the image you were called to shine forth in this world. And there are many ways to do this respectfully if you trust that the fullness of God's love and grace is bigger than any one of us could ever hold or contain. You are part of something bigger than yourself, It's God-based, God-shaped, God-designed. So this day, forget what lies behind you and press forward together with those around you to what lies ahead, that we may be forever found in Christ. Amen.